Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure coming to you from Waikiki Beach. Last week we had the Big Duke Ocean Festival. It's a gathering of the tribe from all over the world to to surf, to outrigger canoe, to sail, to swim, to play water polo. Um, everything that you can do in and on the water we do here at the Duke Ocean Fest in honor of my boy, boyhood hero, Duke Kanamoku. Last week, Cindy and I tandem surfed. I don't know if you know, uh, that's why I met my wife is through tandem surfing. And we uh, made it through our first heat, made it through our second heat, made it to the semifinals. And we didn't think we were going to make it to the semifinals. So we walked our board back to our house and, you know, I was showered up and relaxing. And they go, oh, you made it to the semifinals. Your heat starts in an hour. We go, ah, we don't think so. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. anyway, um, we're looking out at the, at the beautiful Pacific Ocean right now, uh, just above St. Augustine's Catholic Church. Uh, looking out the ocean, there's corduroy to the horizon. Waves are rolling in. We'll be right back with the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to invite you to check out my newest book, 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? It's been bumping into the top 10 in Christian men's books uh, for the last year. Sometimes it, it, it goes down and it's just in the top 100, but it's doing very well. And I think there's a reason for it. I think it's a time right now when men want, uh, men are realizing their call to be manly and women, uh, wherever we go, they say, please tell the men we need for them to be men again. So I think you'll find yourself in this book, men, if you order this book. Um, a lot of the men who don't really like to read it, I challenge them just to read the first chapter. And we've had a lot of them write to me and say, I read the whole book over the weekend and then I started it over again on Monday. So it's a good, it's a great book. It's a great dialogue. It talks with men uh, like men talk with men. It's, it's Christian, it's Catholic, but it's manly. So uh, there's nothing more manly than being a Catholic. Speaking of manliness, we have with us today Deacon uh, Lou Aaron from the Boise area. He's a chef. Uh, he's a deacon. And we're going to talk story with him about his journey and uh, also his uh, ministry. Now he's been going through a going through a battle with with cancer. I've gone through cancer. Uh, one of our producers has gone through cancer, the cancer battle. I know maybe some of you are facing it now. So we're going to talk story, get deep with that too, with our guest, Deacon Lou. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. You know, this is a pre-recorded uh, radio show, so this will probably be coming out in the winter. But we love Boise. What's it? What's it like there today? It's 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 end of August when we're recording this. Oh, it's it's absolutely beautiful here. Just the last week has changed into fall weather. We're in the mid seventies, low eighties, and it's football weather. It's just beautiful. It is. I know. We had a big rival with you with, with you guys, Boise, and and Hawaii had a huge rivalry back in the day. And I remember having a bet with my friend Mark Buchanan, who was a professor there at the university. And, if, if Boise beat us, I had to wear a Boise shirt for a week all around Waikiki. <laughs> well, I used to watch those games too. They were it was a good rivalry. Yeah, there and and I remember he came came here, came to the game once with me here, and uh, we we won. I don't remember what, but the stands were packed, and and uh, it was a great rivalry. And I love the style of football Boise plays too. So, yeah, time for yeah. football. By the time this airs, it'll be almost the, towards the end of the football season. But uh, welcome, hopefully, we'll hopefully we'll be in the top. Top, top 12 to get in that playoff. Yeah, wouldn't that be something? You know, I, I, I mean, Boise's the first play, the first team that kind of just went off the off the uh, reservation, as you might say, in Idaho. Um, when you started having that blue-colored turf and uh, <laughs> like, what's that? Well, wait till you see us play football, you know? Um, so, yeah, I hope Boise, and I hope I went to Baylor. So um, hopefully Baylor had a, had a good season this year. Uh, right now, about this time when we're talking, Cindy and I will be out on our sailboat. We sail in the the Virgin Islands, uh, you know, for two or three months at a time, uh, just kind of wow. bopping around. And but it's hard hard to get football right when it gets exciting. You know, I have Starlink, but it's hard to get the get the right game. But anyway, yeah. Deacon Lou, welcome to our show. We're looking forward to talking story about your own walk with your own journey with the Lord, and uh, and then um, you your call to the diaconate and what you the way your God's opened up opened a door for new ministry for you in the area of the, in this hope because you're going through cancer. You're 
it's opened up a whole new door for you. Can you talk, Troy, with us a little bit about uh, how it is that you became, uh, how, you, how it is that you went deeper with the Lord, first of all? Well, I mean, I was raised Catholic. I was an altar boy when I was a kid. I mean, it's a, it's a story you hear a lot. I went to Catholic school, went to grade school, went to high school, graduated, graduated from a Catholic high school in 1980, and then I just walked away. Um, and I was a typical cradle Catholic that really didn't know my faith. And I became a man of the world in the 1980s. I have alcoholism in my family and, and a talented cook. I started cooking when I was 14, so that would have put me in 1976. I started cooking in a hotel restaurant and fell in love with cooking, but also fell in love with drinking. And I graduated in 1980 and I just quit going to church. It was nothing that Catholic Church did to me. It just, I just decided to, to leave and start living my life, you know, early 20s and being a crazy restaurant employee. Alcohol is always around. And mm. I really, really just became an alcoholic and went through the 1980s covering my alcoholism not really accepting the fact that I had alcoholism. Um, yeah, had very talented well, wait a minute, cooks. Wait a minute, so how, do you, how does someone know that they're an alcoholic? Uh, because so many people, well, I, mean, I think, I see people that they say, well, they're social drinkers and, or they're, they're, they're able to function and they can go to work. I mean, how do you know if someone is, a, is an alcoholic? Well, I never got challenged on it because my talent as a chef, I could hide it. I would, I would be drinking from 7 o'clock in the morning till 9 o'clock at night, all day long, every day. I did it for 15 years. but I, I, And I never really had that talk with myself thinking I had a drinking problem until I got married. But you, once you're in the mix, you can, you can I mean, I, can, I could sense an alcoholic a mile away now. I, I, I can see the, the traits and the triggers that happen to people. And in the ministry that through my restaurants that I own, I, can, I, I deal with it every single day in my restaurants. But mm. in the 1980s, it was, it was uh, I never really looked at myself as an alcoholic until I got started getting sick from drinking. And then I thought, well, maybe I do have a problem. And what do you, my what wife- do you mean, What do you mean getting sick? Okay, so yeah, what do you mean by getting sick from drinking? What do you mean by that? Well, I would- alcohol poisoning i would i would drink so much that when the morning when i woke up i would be i would be throwing up uh couldn't function and you know i would blame it off as the, a stomach flu or or just i was sick that day but i i knew it was from alcohol because well, i was drinking too much you know i'm, I, I'm I, lucky i'm I, I come from from a different side of the world you know i saw my father and my my they're my aunts and uncles they would have a drink but i never saw anybody get crazy and my, my I myself um i like drink a half a beer you know when i when i want a beer or a, a shot of whiskey maybe but if i drink more than half a beer or more than a shot of whiskey i i feel sleepy i don't feel happy um in other words how can you drink like that and still f function i mean can you you don't slur your speech or did you drink so much that your body acclimates to it or how does that happen well after years of drinking yeah your body acclimates to it i uh I could I could work perfectly fine through, I mean, I, like I said, I would I would I would have a seven and seven at seven o'clock in the morning, and by twelve o'clock I would be on the Long Island iced teas and usually drink fifteen to twenty five beers a day, and then I would wow. have to keep my yeah, it was bad. I was I was really bad, and, and when you're in the middle of it, you don't think you're that well, bad. Well, when you just, when you're when you're young, you think you're partying. You're like, oh, I'm 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 having fun. I'm we're partying. But it, oh, after yeah. a while, it's not that fun, you know, and it's no, it's, it's not fun. It's not fun when you realize you have to drink. I mean, and that's part of my journey with the Lord is that that the Lord never left me during the 1980s. I never went to church. I, 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 my mom lived in Atlanta, Georgia, so I would fly from I would go visit her two or three times a year from Boise and I would go to her church and I would, you know, every time I go, I'd get edified in there and I would think, well, you know, I need to go back to church and it never happened. And I met my wife in 1986. She was a hostess at the restaurant I was at. And she had no idea I drank as much as I did. But, you know, we ended up falling in love, got married in 1987. So she really just married a drunk. And Did she know I you were would, a drunk? She, she didn't know? No, or? she didn't know. it. I mean, she, she, it kind of references what you just previously said about, you know, we're just partying. I mean, we're in our early 20s. And we were just partying, and we drank a lot together. We'd go out to bars and, and drink, and we never, she never thought I had a problem and because she had, I, I hid it from her. 
And that was part of my redemption tour in 1993. I, I, I came home from work. I was drunk. And, you know, when I came home from work, it would usually be five or six o'clock at night or sometimes even at, later than that. But I would have to continue to drink to keep my buzz going or I, I, I couldn't function properly. So I had a stash of beer out in my garage and we had a fridge out in the garage and the fridge was situated. So there was a cubby hole behind the fridge, about a, a three foot by six foot high cubby hole. And I would I could just we'd be watching TV or whatever. And I would stand up, go walk out to the garage and chug a beer in about two seconds, throw the beer behind the cubby hole. And, you know, after being year, married for six years in this house, um, a lot of beers accumulated, empty beer cans accumulated behind that fridge. And I never wow. paid attention to you it. had never, you had never. <laughs> it's like uh, finding a uh, a pirate slayer or something that heading back there. Now, yeah. Now, now, now did you? Uh, okay, so we're about to take a break. Here we got to take a break. But um, during this whole time, did you ever think that you had a problem yourself, or you were asking God for help, or yeah, you not had come to I, that yet? I I prayed every single night, probably from 1985 on. I prayed every single night. I remember the prayer very vividly. I would say, "Lord, please let me stop drinking. I just I need to stop drinking. I know so I have you were, a problem." You, you were you were try, you were. They say I heard it said alcoholism is harder than getting away from drugs. It's, it can it can be so addictive for for someone. But you but you you um you were trapped. You know, totally trapped, yeah. totally trapped. I mean, I would I would pray that at night before I went to bed. And I would wake up, and the very next thing I did in the morning would start drinking. And that's mm. it was a total addiction. Uh, alcoholism runs in my family. You know, p things happen throughout your life that, that direct your life. And, you know, when mm. I was 18 years old, my dad was an alcoholic, and he used to work on these on these nuclear power plants all over the country. And my, my mom called me from, from Georgia saying, you got to go pick up your dad. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I got to go pick up my dad. I was 18 years old. I was a chef here in Boise. And... I had to catch a plane and go to Minot, North Dakota and go pick up my dad and rent a car and drive him back to Boise and get him into alcohol rehab. Well, we, and we that got, really. We got to take a hard really, break. We got to take a hard okay. break here. Uh, we'll talk about well, we'll come right back with Deacon Lou Aaron. And we're going to talk a story about that and uh, his conversion, his reconversion to Catholicism and and his ministry now as a deacon. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Schoolofmanliness.com is a place for men of grit and grace to join together, to inspire, to encourage, and to challenge each other to grow in manly virtue. Members receive morning man meditations, a monthly curriculum that is rich with audio, video, and written content, and a trail guide to help you map out your new trajectory. Many of our members lead their sons through this same curriculum. Your membership gives you access to both the Man Cave, which is our non-Facebook type community, and the School of Manliness at schoolofmanliness.com. Become a member at schoolofmanliness.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link, or go to NotreDameFCU.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. My newest book, 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone, has hit the top five in Christian books for a good reason. It's because men are searching for traction and a trail guide to live out the unique calling and the gifts that they were born with, that each man individually is factory loaded with by God. Paul said, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, do all things in love. Finally, here is a book that talks with men the way men talk with each other. Just plain old straight shoot. By the way, Mama Bears, this is your chance to get this message to your men. Go to schoolofmanliness.com or anywhere books are sold. 12 Rules for Manliness. Where have all the cowboys gone? This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. 
The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I want to invite everybody to go to our website, schoolofmanliness.com. That's the new name of our website, schoolofmanliness.com. Uh, it's a place where the women can go and sign up for our weekly email. Uh, and soon we're hoping to bring up a new YouTube show, uh, Spirit of Event Adventure TV with Bear and Cindy, where we're, when we're out sailing or surfing here in Hawaii or whatever we're doing, we'd like to bring you along with us. and. Uh, share the gospel too while we're doing that. So, uh, women, we'd love for you to go there, and for men, go go there. Join our man cave, become a member of the School of Manliness, and uh, participate with us there at schoolofmanliness.com. We're we're back here with our guest, Deacon Lou Aaron. De Deacon, I have certain memory of Minot, North Dakota. Oh, do you? Yes. One day when I was about maybe six years old, I was told I could have all the ice cream I could eat when I got my tonsils out, because I was a little boy in Valva, North Dakota, and uh, <laughs> Minot was 20 miles away or 30 miles away, and that's where the hospital was. And I was like the dirtiest trick anyone could do, because, dude, I mean, who wants ice cream after with your tonsils? You can't even swallow, you know? <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I was raised, I was, ra I was born in um, uh, Powers Lake, North Dakota. I got to go see my, where I was, the actual, um, baptismal font. They rolled it out for me. I went to Mass there a couple of years ago and visited uh, Wilton, North Dakota, Valva, North Dakota, Bismarck, North Dakota. And uh, but I but then uh, the beautiful drive then from Minot. Where did you go down into South Dakota? Or did you go through Montana to get back to, to went, Idaho? Went through Mo went through Montana. Yeah, and yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah, the, yeah drive, the drive was beautiful, but it was it was very difficult because my dad really didn't know who I was. He was. Are you he serious? Was completely off his rocker drunk and I had to I would have to stop every probably 35 40 miles and get him a six pack of beer to no keep him kidding. from going in. yeah oh yeah cuz cuz he was throwing up convulsions I mean he had to keep drinking and really that's the it, way it was very difficult really really for my thinking uh, I I've gone back and looked at it that really was a pivotal point in my life when I was 18 to that go through that experience because I felt helpless uh I didn't know what to do and and it, it was just shocking having your dad not really know who you are for 24 hours driving back from Minot to Boise. It was really, really tough. But that, did, but that but, didn't incub, that didn't inoculate you from from going that way yourself. Yeah, it's really weird. It, it almost seemed like a trigger to me to get to me to drink more, which is really kind of insane thinking. But now that I've gone through it all, I. I when you get there, there's you have triggers. Anybody with an addiction has triggers that triggers them into doing doing something. And for some reason, I've looked back at that, and that really triggered me into drinking more. And I really went on a binge after that. And and it's really contradictory thinking that I went to save my dad, and then I turn around and start doing the same thing he was doing. But he he Man, went through thirty days of rehab, and you know he never really stopped drinking. He went off the deep end a couple more times, but he he. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess you could say he got it. He got it under control, but he he never never stopped drinking. Well, but how, alcoholism runs in my family. His his dad a, died of alcoholism when he was thirty five years old. They say sometimes it's actually part of the your DNA that you're hardwired yeah. that you're susceptible to it. Well, then how did you? Uh, how did how is it that you became free from that? Well, I like I said, I would pray every night to stop drinking and. On April 26, 1993, I came home from work. I was drunk. I, I had just had like three shots of tequila at, at the restaurant. Came home. I walked in to the kitchen, and my wife looked at me. She says, what, what, what are all those beer cans doing behind the fridge out there? And it was like the Holy Spirit just took me over and said, you need to tell her what's going on. So I just looked at her, and I said, honey, I'm an alcoholic. And she said, What? She goes, you're not an alcoholic. And then I just sat her down on the bed and I just started telling her everything I'd been doing every day. And she was completely dumbfounded and shocked. And, you know, the next morning I woke up and and I had been liberated. I, I was free. I knew from that point forward I was never going to have another drink in my life. Well, and you, I know woke that up, that's you woke up in the morning and, and you, you had this overwhelming need, a physical need to drink. What yeah, was different about was that good. morning? 
it was gone, completely gone. I, I, you know, we had that initial talk in the morning about going to A classes, uh, starting to talk about the withdrawals that I was going to have. And, you know, because, you know, you read about alcoholics when they stop drinking, you have to have transitions. Well, I didn't have any transition. I didn't have any withdrawals. I had no shakes. I had nothing. It was like God just it's took a miracle. everything. It was a complete miracle, a complete miracle. Because I never once said I was an alcoholic to anybody. I never even said it to myself. And for him to put those words in my mouth to my wife, that was the that was the answer to my prayer. It was like, okay, that's it. And it was really tough the next six months of our marriage because my wife had married a drunk. And we we had she had to relearn who I was. She didn't know who I well, was. Who, who were you? How did you change? Ah, well, I wasn't falling asleep in my chair at eight o'clock at night. I was I was active. I, I was clear headed. I wasn't, you know, foggy all the time. I wasn't arguing with her all the time and she was like who are you i don't know who you are and it really took six months for us to get to know each other again which became out much happier after that obviously well doesn't and, it feel better too because you're living a life of deception it's not just that you're alcoholic but you're lying to her and to oh, everyone yeah. around you so didn't it feel good not to have that having to be deceptive anymore and to, you know? well, exactly that that's what i'm saying i felt like liberated i was free I, I had that burden off my shoulders and i i just knew that i was going to not drink again you know, I went to the restaurant that morning and told all the bartenders and the you did. Sir, oh yeah, I went and told them. I said I'm not drinking again. They all laughed at me like, yeah, yeah, right. You're not drinking again. And you know, it's been it's been thirty thirty over thirty one years, and I'm not had a drink. And it was it was it was an, a miracle, a total miracle. But praise God. What? You know, I we had two small kids. My when 1983, my daughter was three, my son was five. My wife was raised seven day at Venice, and she wasn't raised in a, I mean, it wasn't like they were going to church every Sunday. Her family was Seventh-day Adventist. They never really went to church, but they had the Seventh-day Adventist background. And I hadn't been, I hadn't gone to church since 1980, other than a couple of times with that my mom's, you know, with my mom when I went and visit her. And so when I stopped drinking, there, there was like a void in our lives all of a sudden that we need to do something. And so my wife and I both said, well, we need, we need to start going to church. We have these small kids. Let's go to church. And I had no idea the difference in religions. I was I thought everybody was the same. So it's a it's a shocking it. thing. It's a shocking thing when you're Catholic and you go into a Protestant church, it's like it's and then I think I think it's even more shocking for a Protestant to go into a Catholic. What are these guys wearing the stuff they wore, the kings and you know, it's like medieval. What the what are we standing in? Are we doing calisthenics? What is this, you know? It's it it can be a cultural shock. So probably for both ways, right? Did she ever come with you to her to your church then or yeah, well, she well, she had never really gone to church. I mean, she she mm. I mean, like I say, she was raised Seventh Day Adventist, but she was really never had gone to church. So we, but we talked about it. We talked about going to church. We talked about going to church for three years. We never went to church, and talking the, don't the story get the, goes, talking don't get the job done, son, as John Wayne would say. No, no, and I'm a very goal oriented person. When I was 18, I had a manager of this restaurant I worked at says, "What are you going to do? What are you going to do with yourself in life, Lou?" And I. I said, well, I don't really know. I, you know, I hadn't decided I was going to be culinary chef or whatever yet. And so he told me to write down my goals. And I said, what do you mean write down my goals? And he said, write down everything. It can be silly or whatever. I want, he says, you need to write down your 30 goals before you're 30 years old, whatever they are, and put them up on your fridge. So I wrote down these silly goals when I was 18 years old of everything that I wanted to accomplish before I was 30. And it's amazing that I accomplished every one of those except one. And the very last one was to own my own restaurant, and I bought my first restaurant when I was 31, so I missed it by a year. You know, I, but, I, really, I really believe in that. You know, I, I, in my book, I talk about riding the proving trail and how you're not just passing through life. And I, when no. I was young, yeah, when I was, when I was like in high school, I started, I started writing down those kind of goals. And I, I have volumes, and I can reach, I have volumes of these books of my goals. People who can watch it and can see wow. probably 20 of these. Because the goal then becomes an action plan. And that's how I think the Lord sifts you when you write things down. But there is there was this one verse I came across when I was about 19, Deacon, that is from Habakkuk. Like whoever reads that, except for maybe a Catholic, when it comes up in, in the, you know. <laughs> but it, it, there's a it, there's a there's a um, there's a scripture verse where it says, "My son, write this vision down in letters big enough so the one who's reading it can run while he's reading. And if the mm. vision and if the vision tarries, wait for it." 
for it will surely come. So it's a vision, really, of a runner during wartime running from town to town and reading the news, right, as he runs through town about mm-hmm. a victory or, or something. But I, I took that to heart, and I wrote them down. And if the vision tarried, I would wait for it. Now, my dad used to say, you write in pencil, not in ink, because God, God, you know. But as you write a, a vision down, you write a plan down, and you begin to move towards it, two things happen. One of the things is I think you move... God can, can direct you. You know, like when I'm, when I'm uh, in, in a sailboat and we have no wind, we're not going anywhere. We're just going to go, we're just going to drift. But when you, can catch the, when you can catch some wind, then you can actually direct the, the path of the sail. You can almost go into the wind if you need to, but you need to have, mm. like riding a bicycle without, in slow motion. It's very hard. But once you begin to move, God can direct you. And the yes. other thing is, is I think is when you have a, a, a gr- vision and a dream like that, you, you have to be realistic. It has to be, um, you have to know what your abilities are, what your desires are, what you don't like, and also what your limitations are. And somewhere in there are your navigational beacons, and you pursue that. But I found that that one quote from uh, G- Captain Jack Sparrow at the end of uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, and we sail in that area a lot where all that Blackbeard and all those mm-hmm. people were. And he says, now bring me that horizon. And and it seems to me as, as you begin to... F- Feel, sense the Lord and pursue God these visions that God gives to you you go to them but the vision comes to you too it's like it's like he, 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 things accelerate you know I got I got sidetracked we're talking about Deacon Lou Aaron now we're going to talk when we get back that's good stuff no, yeah, that's that really good? good stuff yeah yeah, yeah that's real good we're talking yeah, about Deacon, I use, I use, yeah. a, I use a lighthouse as, as an example all the time well, let's talk about that right? when we come back let's talk about that when we come back yep, that's you a, got okay. it. we'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure Here is a YouTube video short, which is based on an excerpt from my newest book, 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? All my heroes were cowboys. Cowboys were men who put others first, who rode for the brand, who got the job done come hell or high water. They persevered and kept fighting even when wounded. They were as dangerous as a rattlesnake or a cornered mountain lion. They were not to be taken lightly. Every man's heart comes factory loaded with a call to heroic virtue, to champion a cause that is greater than he is. And so he reaches out to a God that is greater than him too. He rides high in the saddle of his principles and his dreams. He cowboys up. We invite our mama bears to join with us at deepadventure.com. You'll have access to all of the Long Ride Home TV shows even before they air on EWTN. Plus, three years of the shareable Ocean Sunrise daily catechism videos. Plus, at deepadventure.com, a 20% discount at our online store with all of our great t-shirts and clothes and books and rosaries and medals and all kinds of accessories. You'll also get an autographed copy of Bear's latest book, and for a limited time, a Catholic biker stuffed teddy bear. All at deepadventure.com. Come on, Mama Bears, let's hear you roar. Go to schoolofmanliness.com and subscribe to our weekly email to receive video YouTube links of the Bear Wozniak radio show, as well as the Spirit of Adventure with Bear and Cindy TV show, which, by the way, is filmed in the tropics, as well as our manly evangelistic YouTube shorts. Go to schoolofmanliness.com. Be the kind of man that when he gets out of bed in the morning, the devil says, oh no, he's up. Go to deepadventure.com and invite Bear to speak. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wasing Adventure. Please, women, I'm talking to you right now. Go online and get the book, 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? My wife inspired me to write this. We were driving along the road here in Waikiki, going up around Diamond Head, and the song by Paula Cole came on, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? She said, you're going to like this song. And it inspired, it really inspired a whole book. And so get this book for the young men in your life. It's a, it's a great, it's a book that anyone really confirmation age or older could read, but men of all ages love it. And we really encourage the women, especially the younger women, to read this book so they can help define what it is, what kind of man they're really looking for. But speaking of cowboys, we got Deacon Lou Aaron with us from Boise, Idaho, the home of Salt and Light Radio, one of my places, one of the places I love the most. My wife and I love going through Boise. 
I used to drive through all through there all the time when I had a cabin up in Montana. But uh, but Lou, we were talking Deacon Lou, which is important to call you Deacon because Revelations doesn't talk about radio DJs and surfers being around the throne, but it, many, it does mention deacons. So I, I get no, but seriously, it does. So it's a, it's it really something to be with a, with a deacon. My dad was a deacon, by the way. But oh, tell wow. us about That's the lighthouse that you were talking about. Well, I just it's it's kind of like what you said with direction and navigation. We, you know, I, I always use a I use I always use this analogy with my employees because when I was going through the ranks working for large corporations, being a, I was a corporate chef, I was an executive chef of these restaurants, and we always sit in these boardroom meetings, and everybody be going, why are why aren't we why, why aren't we busy? What, what's going on? We have problems here, problems here, and everybody has an employee manual. And I would always open up the employee manual and I'd look at these executives and I'd say, well, what's our mission statement? And none of them would know what the mission statement was. Oh. And every, co every company I worked for, yes. that was like the first thing you read. You opened up the book and there was the mission statement, but nobody ever knew the mission well, statement. Well, let me ask you this question. Do you have a mission statement about your life? Well, of course I do. What is that? Of course I do. Well, I mean, I mean the, my mission statement for life is, is to do God's will. I mean, that's, Amen. that's been day yeah. one. But as a company, I wrote my I wrote my mission statement. I met, I, I, I remember when I bought my restaurant in 1994. I that's the first thing I did is wrote the mission statement and wrote the action plan underneath the mission statement. And then got, every employee meeting, I have an employee meeting every single month, and I use the lighthouse as an analogy, saying that that you got two boats out in the ocean, out in dense fog, and one of them's just out wandering, not knowing where they're going. And we have that lighthouse. That's our mission statement. And then I break down what the word mission means. The word mission comes from the Latin word missio, which means missile, which we are going straight to that. We're going straight to that lighthouse. And that's our mission statement. So when you when you make people start living the mission statement, your restaurant is successful. And that's why I've owned this restaurant. Now I have two restaurants now, but I've Very owned good. it for 30 years. It goes back to life. I just got to tell you, it's like you read my book. So the first chapter of my book is about having a mission statement. <laughs> that we we have to we have what, what I call what I call it is a creed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like um, my boyhood hero Duke Hanamoku down here. There's a statue just a block a block from his one of his four the four statues of him in the world. Uh, he said, uh, "I believe in aloha. I greet everyone with aloha. This is my this is my belief. This is my creed." Um, and so, starting out with a very and aloha means to give love. Ha means lo ha, breath. So it's to give mm. breath. And he did do that, save many people. But um, um, I, so I talk about in the book, um, uh, and I'm so glad I'm going to use that. I, I'm going to uh, use that thing about missio. I didn't know that. I'll quote Lou, Deacon Lou when I use it, of course. But that's awesome But um, that, that it comes from missile. And I remember the reason why you write down your goals more specifically is I remember the way missiles uh, back in the day used to be guided to the target wasn't that they knew exactly where the target was is it would get it would get um negative feedback and it would adjust its course back and forth mm -hmm. it, when it got off course it knew it you know it mm -hmm. knew that more than it knew it was on course so by it would keep adjusting back and forth but my personal creed is that the most radical quest a man can pursue is to abandon himself to the wild adventure of god's will and so you nailed it the, mo the most dangerous thing a man can do is to pray that prayer, God, not my will, but your will be done. It's right yeah. in the Our Father, thy will be. Mm -hmm. That's a dangerous prayer. It's dangerous to you because it can mean laying down your life. And it's yeah, dangerous it to is. Satan. It's dangerous to Satan. Um, it's just a dangerous prayer. Jesus was a Jesus was a gnarly, gnarly man. He was, of course, God too, but he was gnarly as a man. But he knew what his mission was. When he went to Jerusalem, it says he set his face like flint. And mm -hmm. went up because he was going to face death. So I love it that your mission is thy will be done. That's it. That, that is, it should be everybody's mission. I mean, it, yeah. it took me a long time to get to that point. Yeah. Um, that, I, that point came on November 3rd, 1996. Like I said, we were talking about going to church for three years. Well, the Holy Spirit came on November 3rd, 1996 and burned our house down. And we lost everything. Uh, yeah. Lost our pets, lost our car. Lost, I mean, we lost everything. And it was... Uh, uh, 100% tragedy, but what it did is it made us realize what was important in life and not, because we were keeping up with the Joneses family. I mean, that was us to a T, I'm very materialistic. And when you lose everything in real, and luckily we didn't lose family members because the, the fireman said that my, I wasn't home at the time, but my fireman said that they had about two minutes to get out of the house or they would not have been gotten out of the house, my wife and two kids. 
So really brought us back to realizing that what was important and that was the that was when god said okay it's time for you guys to come back to us so that's when i said okay well we need to start going to church well my sister my my wife's sister is a devout baptist so we started going to the baptist church and that was the, f- the first culture shock like you were saying <laughs> i walked into the baptist church and i thought this is not what what's going on here i yeah, had no idea yeah 40 45 minute sermon and yeah and we an think 10 minutes is too long right yeah, but I, I, I do. I, I do love the Baptist Church. I do. Lo- I, I went to a Baptist university, and it was tough, you know, Lou, because I, I gave my life to the Lord through the during the Charismatic Renewal, while I'm oh, going wow. to a Baptist university, the Catholic Renewal, and they weren't ready for what what hit them when they came back after when they went away for summer and, I, and I, during the middle of summer I I had that experience. They thought they loved Jesus. Wait till they met Bear, because they had they had always said we're praying for you, we're praying for you, and then we I had that tremendous infusion of God's love. So so you went to the Baptist church and oh I have so many great friends that go to the Baptist church but oh how I wish some of them ask me questions. I wish I could I wish they would be open to uh, understanding more about the Catholic faith. The book Crossing the Tiber uh, uh, by, uh, yeah. by by St- Stephen Ray is what brought mm-hmm. me back to the church. Okay so now I'm, I'm stumbling over over your words. So you went to you went to the Baptist church and you said this isn't like it, it just didn't it wasn't yeah. working it, it just it didn't feel right it just did not feel right at all and we had a catholic church two minutes from our house so my wife said well you were raised catholic so let's go check out this church so we walked into the church we went to mass and when we were walking out my wife said i felt like i was at home and that was like oh okay. yeah so no i so mean that's that's church. that's a phenomenal statement for someone who's never been in the church before no she'd never walked into catholic church in her life yeah never. and do you think it, it's yeah what is it you think that that made her feel so much at home? Well, it was the Eucharist. I'm, uh, we know we both know that. Uh, you can tell her now that it was the hunger for the Eucharist. I mean, I couldn't receive, and uh, I, she, we went for a couple months, and she said, "I'm not going to become Catholic. Don't force me." And I said, "I, I said that's fine. I'm not going to force you into doing anything." And then the day before RCIA started, she said, "I want to go to RCIA." So I said, "Okay, well, let's go to RCIA." So I went to RCIA with her, and I learned, and then then I just. I developed this hunger, and I, I use the words, I stole it from Scott Hahn, but I became a Bible junkie. I mean, I could not put the Bible down. I I mean, I, I mean still to this day, my Bible is, I, I take it everywhere I go. I, I'm in it every day. And it's like on Salt and Light Radio, I do the Cooking with Scripture segment every Tuesday morning because, you know, food is all throughout the Bible. So I, I'm, I'm a history nut, and I just, I, just, I just love the Bible. And that really just brought me home to the Catholic Church because I started getting challenged by everybody. My work coworkers, my family members. Oh, about the faith. You, they, about you the, need, oh, yeah. Oh, you they needed were, to be able to. Yeah. yeah. Worshiping Mary, the, the whore of Babylon, the Pope's the Antichrist. I mean, yeah, all, that all that stuff. stuff. Like, it's I so had no sad. idea. Like, what are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. It's and, so you know, we sad that they've been given. The t- well, now, what, yeah. what food are you talking about in the Bible? Are you talking about manicotti or. You're talking about ma- <laughs> ma- <laughs> well, yes, well, banana bread I, or, or, or Manischewitz or what is it? Uh, tons of food. I mean, if you look at any major event in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, any major event was revolved around food. So you, Well, you I know, realize, but dude, I've, I've been there, dude. You, you, you know, you can't even get a cheeseburger there. You don't give you a hamburger with cheese. You can't. <laughs> you can get a lot of stuff. If you like I hummus, mean, you can get a lot of stuff. Oh, um, come on now. There's, <laughs> you, you open up the scriptures. There's plenty of every two food you can imagine. Yeah. It's all, the- yeah, it's all, it's all there. But, I, but you know, one thing is like, you know, I'm, I'm Ukrainian. You know, when the emperor uh, Vladimir back around five or six hundred said, "We're done being pagans," uh, let's decide what we're gonna. We don't want to do that anymore. Let's let's become something else. He sent his emissaries out to the Muslims, and they came back and said, "Well, they're really strict. A lot of rules, and they don't eat bacon." <laughs> so then he sent them out to the Jews. Well, they're really strict. They got a lot of rules, and they don't eat bacon. <laughs> then he sent them down to the Sophia, <laughs> Hagia Sophia, and they go beautiful, beautiful services, beautiful music, and 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 he go yeah yeah yeah, but do they let you eat bacon? Yes, they let you eat bacon. So <laughs> I always say I'm Ukrainian that you know we became Catholics because of beauty and bacon, but now yeah. it's, now now we got to take a break. I'm sorry, I'm I'm having too much fun visiting with you. We'll be no, right back okay. with, De- with De- Deacon Lou Aaron. We're going to talk about why how the hundred different ways he's learned to make. Um, uh, bacon. Be right back with more of the Bear <laughs> Wozniak adventure. People love our EWTN TV show, Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak. 
thanks to you, the show has won four different Tally Awards. And now, instead of waiting each week for the next episode to air, you can actually binge watch our show and even share it with your friends when you go to deepadventure.com and join the Mama Bears or the Man Cave. Along with all the other benefits, you get total access to all the seasons of our aired episodes, plus instant access to episodes that won't even air for several months. Long Ride Home with Bear Wastick, a great way to communicate the gospel in a gritty enough way that even tough men will stop and watch at deepadventure.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to NotreDameFCU.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. Announcing Spirit Adventure TV with Bear and Cindy. So many people, especially you mama bears, tell us we want more of Bear and Cindy together. Well, we're happy to announce our website, spiritofadventuretv.com, as well as our YouTube channel, Bear Wozniak Spirit of Adventure, where you can watch Spirit of Adventure TV with Bear and Cindy. Join us where we live in the Hawaiian Islands or where we sail our boat, the Spirit of Adventure, in the Caribbean. Experience both adventure and serenity with us as we share our life together, as well as the joy and the wisdom of our faith. Go to spiritofadventuretv.com to find out more and subscribe on YouTube to Bear Wozniak Spirit of Adventure. And join us, Spirit of Adventure, with Bear and Cindy. Buy 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? at schoolofmanliness.com or wherever books are sold. Mama Bears, get these books into the hands of your men. Still listening? I thought we warned you to change to an easy listening station. Well, you asked for it. Here is more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. Aloha and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak adventure. We have with us today Deacon Lou Aaron, who is a chef, owns uh, two two restaurants. He's been an executive sh executive chef too. Uh, he, he lives in Boise, Idaho. So I want to ask you what. What's the name of those restaurants in, in Boise? Well, there, it's pretty funny. I mean, I, I was classically trained chef, and I thought I would own a French bistro when I wanted to own oh. that restaurant. My goals, oh. and I, I was driving by this 50s drive-in in 1994 that it, I went to as a kid in the 1970s. I used to go get shakes there. It was built in 1957, and there was a for sale sign on it, and I thought, hmm, oh, that's interesting. So I got a deal together and I bought the drive-in and and I put I put real cooks in there and I made I started making everything from scratch and still make sauces and stocks and you know wow. everything we make, we make all of our own stuff and we've had uh, diners drive-ins and dives come twice to us we've been really on, my wife loves that yeah. show oh okay. well, tell yeah, me the name of the restaurant so next time I come it's west side drive-in west side drive-in so yeah, is just it go to drivein.com and you can learn all about us. But it's uh, is it on the west flat. side? Is it on the Pardon? west side? Is it on the west side of Boise? Or did no, we... well, when when it was built in 1958, it was on the west side. Now it, it's Boise down. outgrew it, right? Yeah, now it's downtown. <laughs> so it's uh, it was on the west side now. Yeah, it but you're, not selling, you're, not sell, you're not selling. You're not selling. You're not selling buffalo burgers there. Uh, no, we well, we did sell buffalo burgers for a while, but we we you know we we sell all kinds of. I mean, real stuff. I mean, we make our own meatballs, lasagna, pork ribs, oh. prime rib. Oh. We make all of our sauces, like I say, and we make this novel dessert called the Idaho ice cream potato, which you've got to have. Oh I mean, my gosh, I'm going to come. Yeah, we love Boise. We we we'll we'll be back. We'll be we'll be there. Yeah, soon. it's fun. And we opened up another one after Guy Fieri came in 2009, and said, "Man, you need to franchise this place." So we built built another one over on the other side of town so we have we have two of them now and we've had we opened that in 2012 so that's so it, it's cool. been a blast. i'm slowing down both my kids are running running the restaurants now. well now yeah, we got we got to get back to this 
we got to get back to this. This you 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 came you came to church and she, she was drawn probably because of the Eucharist. Did didn't you at some point uh, find the early church fathers? What was it that that got you really uh, drawn well, back I, to the church? Well, the thing is, is I, I I would get in these arguments. I mean, I pretty much picked an argument with every pastor in town when I was trying to defend our faith, and I started realizing that there was many more writings out there other than the Bible, and. You know, you, who are you going to go to? Is you going to go to the followers of Christ and their followers and their disciples? And all these people wrote, and, and the church fathers really, I mean, it just it just opened up my eye because all, all the sacraments were in the church fathers. The masses yeah. in the church fathers. Everything yeah. was there. The yeah. writings, I mean, I mean uh, I'll never forget. What, what, what church here. father? For, yeah, go ahead. Tell me where, where, yeah. Well, I mean, there's plenty of, I mean. But I mean, which I one love, or two really grabbed you? Well, well. Augustine and Jerome are my, two of my favorites as mm -hmm. far as as fathers fathers but I mean Ignatius of Antioch I, I love yes. reading his story on his way to yeah. death yeah and, and his bravery his courage and just talk about the will of the father yeah um, you know uh, all the, the the church fathers in collections I mean I've, I've you know William Jurgens wrote those three volumes on the church fathers and I've got all three of those books and I've, I've referenced those over the years so many times, and I would encourage everybody, every Catholic should own those, those books, because they just reinforce your faith and realize that what we're doing today, you know, I, I just love it when somebody comes and tells me that Mass is boring. It's like they have well, no they go, idea. And we're, we're, we're Bible-believing church. Shoot, you only, well, who gave oh, you yeah. the Bible, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, I do it in my in my preaching i break down the mass all the time I, I i make our i make our congregation understand i challenge them to grab a portion of the mass every week and to go home and study what what why we're saying why do we say holy, yeah, holy, it's holy. so every what? every single sentence is so yes. significant and every motion Dude. of the priest is so Gigantic. significant oh you catholics we we just we believe in the bible well do you stand up while the gospel is being read <laughs> does does your pastor kiss the gospel? You know, every everything is so is 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 there in the early church. For me, it was Saint um, uh, Justin Martyr when he oh, when yeah. he the Epiclesis. When I was reading that, that was the moment when he began to talk about how the, we're not cannibals, but it is the body and blood of Jesus mm. Christ. Um, and he wrote and he wrote the I guess it's the Epiclesis when he wrote what happens at the moment when the host is being uh, sanctified. I. At that moment, I said, well, if the primitive church was a Catholic church, I need to be Catholic. Now, Deacon, I need to give you, I, we're, we've come, I have a few moments. I have a, about three minutes left. You, you're going through a cancer yourself, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I wonder if you would just reach out and, and, and share with people. Um, yeah, I just, I, I just, well, I just want people, to, you know, you're in charge of your own health, and, and I... You know, I've been a chef for 40 years, and when I got diagnosed with an incurable form of lymphoma in 2015, and I've learned more about food in the past nine years than I did the previous 35 being a chef because food, God gives you food, and he's really brought me full circle with learning of of what food does, of how beneficial it is, and and that you really need, your body needs good, real food. And it has really helped me on my journey. Now, in 2022, I went to stage four and got 50% of my bone marrow, and they were telling me I was going to die. And I had, I was lucky because I was uh, at my church, and I was having a priest retreat at my church. We were hosting it, and I had 54 priests pray on me at Mass. And that was that was like I could feel the whole Holy Spirit almost knocked me down from that one. I, I just couldn't believe it. You, could, you, could, you sense the, could you sense the healing power of God touch you? Is that what you're saying? Oh, my goodness. I've never felt anything like that in my life. I yeah. mean, the power went through me like it was, it was I, can't, I can't really describe yeah. the feeling. It wasn't, it wasn't, an, it wasn't an emo. you know, when you're a Christian, you can become emotional because the Holy Spirit touches you. But it wasn't emotionalism that got you there. It was just a, a regular prayer. And all of a sudden, you know, because I was miraculously healed, too. A very severe mm. back issue, and it happened just like you're saying. Prayed over, and immediately I felt the presence of the Lord, and um, and, and and I knew I was healed. And so, yeah. so, yeah. so, the, so, because you look great. Yeah, I mean, I feel good. I mean, I, 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 uh, I my cancer has been disappeared three months after after I got diagnosed with stage four lymphoma, and I was not. I had cancer everywhere, all over my body. So and this it, is and, three, within three months. It was all gone. You said. It was pretty much all gone. Yep, my CAT scan, my CT scan showed that it was all diminished to nothing, and my oncologist could believe it. 
And, you know, you know, I attribute 99% of that to God and prayers because I really understood what prayer is now. But I Amen. also other things that I took control of my body and, and just and, eating and healthy just, and the right stuff. But God opened. God gives you so many blessings when you get a disease or or, or whatever happens to you in your life. He gives you that's an opportunity to share the gospel with other people. And I get people every day with cancer come in and talk to me where I never would have thought I would have ever met these people. Just you got to realize when God puts you on a path or gives you, I mean, when you get stuff that bad, you think it's bad, it really turns out to be a blessing. God can make all things work together for the good. I know when I went through, uh, when I got that, when I, the back healing too, I knew I was healed. I mean, I knew it. I was just, whoa, I, I, I knew it. It took mm. six, six weeks before the pain left me. And then I've never felt it again. But then going yeah. through cancer, you know, I didn't tell anybody about this while I was going through it. But when I had prostate cancer, um, uh, the radiation, all that, it really set me back. I didn't realize, though, for how long I'd been suffering from having it. Uh, and, and it was and it was work to get back. But it goes back to I, I was an athlete before. I'm an athlete again now. But eating right, working out, taking care of mm -hmm. you. You have to be a good steward of that temple. Deacon, uh, can you take just a few moments here to just pray for anyone who's going through that kind of a battle? And then we got to we got to close. Yeah, sure. In the name of the Father and Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we know that your will is for all of us to be happy in your heavenly kingdom and to live the life that you want us to live. So when we're presented with challenges and all these people going through suffering and troubles in their life, make them realize that they need to wrap their arms and embrace the crucifix mm -hmm. and, and because mm -hmm. of the love that you've shown us throughout our lives, that we can show our love back to you through the cross and realize that that all good comes through you, and you can use us as your tools to spread that gospel. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, let me pray for every, anyone who's ailing. We just pray for a miracle of, of, of healing, because Jesus is still in the healing business. He's still a Savior. He's still in the Savior biz, too. So uh, come to the Lord. Come to the Lord. And, uh, Amen. Come Amen. To his table. Thank you, Deacon Lou, for being with us. You're welcome. I can, I can hardly wait to meet meet you in person. You know, I've been to Boise several times, but we got to come by your restaurant. Yeah, we got to hook and, up. We need yeah, to hook up. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you for responding to God's call. Yeah, that's my honor. God, I wish I was in Boise right now. I remember we rode our motorcycles up the Payette River there, uh, along the canyon there. And oh, we yeah. got to go. We go. Poor me, I have to be yeah. stuck here in Waikiki. Um, got to say, got to do our sign off, and we do this. The word ha in Hawaii means breath. Aloha means to give breath. So, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. Amen. Aloha to you too, my friend. Thanks for listening to the Bear Wildstick Adventure. Find more manly conversation at the Bear Wildstick Deep Adventure YouTube channel. Subscribe and ring the bell. Thank you.